my name is Dawson Redekop, and this is my wife, Celine. And as Gary mentioned, we are serving as missionaries with Hands at Work in Africa. Um, and I will let my wife share a little bit more. Good morning. Um, so like Dawson said, my name is Celine. Um, and I, yeah, we met in 2017. I'm originally from Abbotsford in BC, and so grew up there, but now, yeah, married a Saskatchewan. Um, yeah, so maybe I can just start by sharing a bit about Hands at Work. So we are um, a nonprofit organization serving in eight countries across Africa, um, and as of today, we're serving over 7,000 children um, in the most vulnerable communities um, in those eight countries. And so kind of the vision of Hands at Work is to mobilize the local church to, to care for the most vulnerable in their communities, to, um, yeah, to, to bring them in and to, and to advocate for them, to speak on their behalf. Um, we equip um, what we call care workers, who are those men and women to care for the vulnerable. Um, we help them provide three essential services of food, basic education, and health care. Um, but kind of more importantly than that, um, help them come to know Jesus so that they can then share Jesus with the children that they're caring for. Um, you know, of course, you know, food, education, health care are so important for, for our children's physical health. Um, but if they don't have Jesus and that physical, it'll just be the physical needs that are being met and it won't actually transform their lives. It'll just help them survive. Um, and we want to do more than just help them survive. We want to help them thrive and become healthy adults who know Jesus and and can then bring that change to to the, their communities and to the other children that they um, are able to meet. And so that's kind of a bit about who we are as hands. Um, we partner with the international church to to advocate and to speak on behalf. Um, and so, yeah, have partners across, I don't know how many, like six or seven different countries across the world um, who are committed to walking with us in that. Um, yeah. Um, yeah, so like Gary mentioned, we had the privilege to have breakfast with him and Pat earlier this week, and Gary asked me a question while we were having breakfast to say if you could share or encourage the, the people of Ozer Mission Chapel with anything, what would it be? And so it took me a minute to kind of think and consider what, I mean, it's kind of a big question if I could share one thing, what would it be? Um, but after thinking for a moment, the encouragement that I can give is to each one of you is to seek Jesus with everything you have. Um, I know, I think all of us in this room have given our lives to Jesus. And kind of like Gary kind of alluded to before, we gave 100%, or Maybe in theory we gave 100%, but I can encourage you practically to give all of yourselves to following and seeking him. It will be the greatest joy you ever experience. I think speaking for myself, like I mentioned, I grew up in the church and I walked away for a long time, but after experiencing just the amazing grace of Jesus as he redeemed me from that pit of, of sin and brokenness that my life was in, and some of you might know my story. That's maybe a story for another day. Um, but Jesus did such an amazing work and, and redeemed me at what felt like my lowest point. And so I remember just being so in awe of, of who this God was that he would answer my prayer. Like, you know, I was this sinful mess of a person. Why would he care? You know, I, I said a prayer in desperation, but who am I to to reach this amazing God that he would then also answer. And I remember praying and saying, my life is yours. Wherever you want me to go, whatever you want me to do, I'll do it. And, you know, that's where, that's why I'm here today. God took me on a huge, or is taking me on a huge journey since then. Um, and so, although our stories, like mine and Celine's, are very different, it's kind of that desire to, to know God and to seek him and to know him more intimately and to follow him where he leads that led both Celine and I to what we're doing in Africa. Um, and so what I wanted to talk about this morning, and Gary again kind of mentioned it, but in developed countries like Canada and, you know, the U.S., U.K., 
places like that, we tend to live, and I think often unknowingly, as if we are the center of everything that happens in life. Everything that we do revolves around us. We're offended if someone does something that doesn't you know, coincide with the way we see things or what we believe. If, if something isn't immediately beneficial to us, it's not even worth our time to do it. Um, if, if someone sees something differently than us, we feel that compulsion to help them believe what we believe. I think probably the best and worst example is this pandemic we're in. Everyone has their views, and Dan shared so brilliantly last Sunday how something so small has divided us. And to me, that it, it's broken my heart to see the way that even within my family and, and people I know, the way that people fight and divide and and they can't even spend time together anymore over something so small. But that's in our culture. We Everything's about us and we want everyone to think and do things the way we do it. But the more I've come to know Jesus and the more we've come to know Jesus, he has challenged that mindset. Um, and so specifically over the last year or so, I would say a, a big theme for Selene and I has been learning what does it mean to be generous? And specifically, what does it mean to be generous with our time? Um, I think it can be easy, in a sense, to be generous with our finances, coming from and being part of a fairly wealthy society. Giving financially is maybe an easier thing. But when it comes to giving our time or our energy for someone I'm just going to say this, it might rub you the wrong way, maybe I won't get invited back again, but it's going to be easier to donate food to VBS than it is to volunteer for that week or to pray through that week. So I'll just leave that there. <laughs> um, yeah, so even though like both Celine and I have surrendered our lives to the will of God and following him wherever he goes, we still wrestle with you know, being obedient with all of ourselves, with all of our finances, with all of our time, with all of our energy. And so I'll let Celine share a little bit more about that. Um, so I'm going to share a story from Mozambique, but I think, I, I, okay, this is a bit off, off the cuff, I guess, but I think something that maybe I can share coming into being married was I think I grew up expecting, you know, you see your parents, your, you know, your mom and your dad, you know, they're home by 5, 5.30, and you have dinner together as a family, and that's kind of like your time as a family. And so I think, like, when Dawson and I got married last year, I kind of came into that, into our marriage, kind of with that, ex that expectation. Having seen that from my dad, um, having seen that from my mom, you know, my mom worked nights as a nurse, and so she was gone from you know, she would wait till us kids were in bed and then she'd be gone from, you know, seven till seven in the morning. But I grew up with that expectation. And so I think, you know, when we got married, the reality for us in particular is that our life isn't like that. Um, you know, people, and, and I think life isn't meant to be like that in, a, in a some senses. I think, when I think about it, I think Jesus's life was the interruptions. Um, you know, how many times was, you know, he with people, he was by himself, but people came and they asked him and he, he didn't grumble and say, okay, well, if I have to, I'll do it for you. Cause that would have probably rubbed people the wrong way, but, but he did it and he did it willingly. And so I think like, I think Dawson and I have felt challenged by that. Like, what does it mean to, to live a life of interruptions and to live a life where, where that's okay. Um, and where that's not something that's actually like looked down upon, but it's something that's celebrated and that's saying, you know, we're able to minister to people through the interruptions. Because often, like, for us, like, so many times, you know, we'll be sitting in the office and I'll be, because I do stuff for social media and I'll be working on things for social media, and someone will come in and ask a question. It'd be easy to think, okay, well, I just got started on this, like, report. I need to finish it. But rather that, than that person's, like, you know, in, in, internally, they're, they're really struggling with something. They need to talk about it. And so what does it mean to, to live for interruptions? Um, so maybe that's just an aside. Um, but I wanted to share a story from, um, I had the opportunity to be in Mozambique a couple years ago and Zimbabwe for a significant period of time. Um, and we serve in 
in four communities in Mozambique, um, and one of them um, is called Matsinio. Um, and we serve 150 kids in Matsinio, um, some of those beautiful kids you'll ever meet. Um, and there's a care worker in Matsinio, so sh she's one of the women from the local church who have answered God's call on her life to care for the vulnerable. And she was, so every day she'll come to the care point, which is the place where, where children come to get food, and she'll come and she'll, she'll either cook for the children and she'll go on holy home visits, so visiting children in their homes, um, and she'll just spend time with them. And so I had an opportunity to sit with her and just to, just to connect and to hear her story. Um, her life has been really, really hard. Um, you know, she has her own family to care for. You know, all majority of our care workers, um, you know, have their own families. And so this is something that they do not because necessarily they have the, the means to do it, but because they, because they care, they sacrifice going to work and finding work to be able to care for children. Um, and so we were sitting outside of a home, and, and for me that year, kind of the story of Jonah had been quite significant. You know, Jonah, he runs away from where God's calling him, um, and, you know, he gets on that boat. I'm not even going to pronounce where he's going on that boat because I get it wrong every single time. Um, but he gets on the boat, and, you know, we know the storm comes, and Jonah, you know, goes, gets thrown into the water. He says, throw me in. And he gets swallowed by the whale, and then the whale spits him up, and he ends up, you know, saying, okay, I'm going to, I'm going to, that didn't work the first time, so I'll go to Nineveh. Um, and so I think that story was quite significant for me in that recognizing that, you know, Jonah's disobedience, Jonah walking away, affected other people. You know, if he hadn't said, okay, throw me in, what would have happened to everyone else on that ship because of his disobedience? His disobedience had, had a direct impact on other people. His disobedience would have had a direct impact on the people of Nineveh and preventing them from hearing, hearing what he had to say and what God had told him to say. Anyways, and so sitting with Maria, I kind of, you know, as is, is often when you're sitting with people in Africa, you'll ask, be asked spontaneously to share a word. And so I find, I'm, I feel like we're getting better at, you know, always having kind of a word at the back of your head in case you're asked, because more than likely you'll be asked and you don't want to sit there being like, uh, I have no idea what to say. And so we were sitting and she said, she asked me if I had a word. And so I shared this story and her response, though very simple in nature, felt very profound. And she said, you know, life is tough. It's hard for me. It's hard, you know, to, to have my own family, but then to, to be coming to here where I feel God's called me to be. And she said, you know, if I chose to walk away, if I chose to say, no, I'm not going to do any more of this work. I could do that, but it would have a direct impact on the kids that I serve. It would, it would potentially cost their survival. And I thought that that was quite a profound thing for one of the most vulnerable women across the world to say that she was so committed to being obedient. She was so committed to giving of her time and her energy that she was willing to, to risk it all. You know, her life to Jesus, following Jesus meant more to her and potentially the cost, you know, to her own family. Um, and so I just thought that that was quite a profound thing to say and quite a challenge to both of us and what it means to, to give generously, to be obedient, even when it feels like that's the last thing on earth that we want to do. So continuing on from there, earlier this year, I was reading through the book of Mark, and if you would like, you can open your Bibles to Mark chapter 3. And I was just, I wasn't reading, looking for anything that related to anything we're talking about, but just these two verses struck me. Um, and I've read Mark before, but something, this day I was reading it, stood out to me. So Mark chapter 3, verses 20 and 21. So this is you know, coming off of Jesus and his disciples walking together for um, some time now, Jesus has done some healings, he's been teaching, so they've spent time together. And so now they come and they're trying to eat a meal together. So Mark chapter 3 verse 20 says, Then Jesus entered a house, and again a large crowd gathered, so that he and his disciples were not even able to eat. When his family heard about this, they took charge of him. For they said, he is out of his mind. And so, the reason that this struck me was because of the disciples' response. They had been serving, 
you know, faithfully for some time, and now they come to eat dinner. So they're all sitting and trying to eat a meal, and a large crowd gathers. And it doesn't say here what Jesus did in response, but it shows that the disciples were annoyed that, at what he was doing, which makes me think he went to go and attend to them. They said he's out of his mind. They couldn't even stop for an hour to eat dinner without people coming around. But Jesus' was, Jesus's response was to tend to them, was to minister to them, was to hear them. You know, you can think of other stories when Jesus is teaching and then they, they bring the paralyzed man and lower him through the roof. If someone, Gary, lowered someone through the roof while you were preaching, I'm sure that would feel very disrupting. People would be upset. But those people knew that Jesus could heal their friend. But Jesus tended to him. He didn't chase them from the house. He welcomed them. And I think so often... You know, for us, we want to respond like the disciples. I think all of us want to respond like the disciples. When, when something comes that in, that's inconvenient, we don't want to, to be obedient in that moment. Um, it's so much easier to say, this is my time. Once it's five o'clock, even as missionaries, and, you know, we've committed our lives, but it's so tempting to say, well, I'll serve between eight and five. But after that, it's for me and my wife. And then we can do whatever we want. But we've been so challenged as we've come to know Jesus more intimately that that's not who he was. And that's not who he has called us to be. And so I just want to leave us with a scripture to kind of close this time. Um, So this is from... Jeremiah chapter 22, verses 13 to 17. So this was God's message to Jeremiah to give to, the, to the, the kings and the leaders and the powerful and wealthy people of Israel, um, which it's kind of hard to summarize the book of Jeremiah. If you haven't read it, you should just read Jeremiah. Um, but God was challenging all of these powerful and wealthy people for the way that they were living. And even though us here, we may not be like powerful people in government, we may not be kings or anything like that, but I think in many ways we live our lives similar to the way they did, seeking to build their own life and forsaking the lives of those around them and those in need around them in pursuit of bettering their own lives. So I'll read this passage. Woe to him who builds his house by unrighteousness and his upper rooms by injustice, making his own people work for nothing, not paying them for their labor. He says, I will build myself a great house with spacious upper rooms. So he makes large windows in it, panels it with cedar and decorates it in red. Does it make you a king or a more special, powerful person to have more cedar? Did not your father have food to drink? to food to eat and did your father not have food and drink he did what was right and just so all went well with him he defended the cause of the poor and the needy and so all went well isn't that what it means to know me declares the lord but your eyes and your heart are set only on dishonest gain on shedding innocent blood and on oppression and extortion. So I'll just leave that with us to to contemplate as we go from here. I'll invite Gary back up. Dawson, I don't know if you know this or not. Um, You you can probably pursue preaching too. And uh, Celine, yeah, great job you guys, great job. This is, a, this is a great couple. Get to know them. Uh, take some time after the service to, to say hi. Encourage them. They need our prayers. They need our support. And, and so, uh, but just, just an awesome couple and an awesome heart for the Lord. And, and, and I just appreciate them so much. And um, I'm not going to add anything because I can't add anything. You guys did an amazing job. But I will close in prayer. And, and I want to send them off with a prayer. They're here for a very short time. And... Um, uh, Celine's been waiting very long and patiently to go back to see her parents in Abbotsford on the 17th. And so 
um, we, we want to send them with our blessing from, from church here. And so they have a very short time, but it's been a great time that we've, we've had the opportunity to have you guys share here. Appreciate that. Let's pray. Lord God and loving Heavenly Father, I just thank you for Dawson and Celine. I thank you for how you have worked in their hearts and in their lives and drawn them to yourself, first and foremost. Building a foundation and, and having a solid foundation for their own personal lives and then to build that, their marriage on that, that solid foundation as a child of God, to be able to, to move and walk in a covenant relationship with, first of all, you, and then to walk into a covenant relationship with each other, becoming one flesh. So God, thank you for that. I pray that on their journey as a, as a husband and wife now, God, that you would just continue to be with them and protect them and, and care for them. And Lord God, that you would just draw them to closer to each other. And even in their differences and their unique um, quirks and all of those things, God, that you would just help them to, to fall deeper in love with, with each other in, in light of all of those different characteristics that you have given to each one of us as, as people. We're, we're all different, and so God, would you just uh, draw them to yourself uh, and, and in light of all of those things. Father, I pray too that even in, in their marriage that they wouldn't be selfish. I pray that they would always look to serve the other. How can I serve you? How can I make your life better? And, and as they do that, that it will follow through and flow into their ministry to be able to make you, uh, to honor and glorify you, making others, making you first and foremost in their life. Oh God, would you continue to protect them and provide for them as they uh, continue to serve you faithfully? Thank you, God, that you have called them to full-time ministry and thank you that they're committed to you, to surrender to you, to, to follow you in, in full-time uh, full ministry. Oh God, would you continue to teach them, continue to grow them as they grow in their faith, grow in their understanding of your word and, and then to be able to communicate that to others that they work with, that they come in contact with and that they serve with. Father, as they spend time with family, uh, the rest of the little bit of time here in Saskatchewan, I pray that it would just be a good time uh, refreshing and, and reconnecting and, and, and just being able to uh, build on those relationships. And I pray too, as they go and visit Celine's family, that they will have a, just an incredible time of, of reunion and uh, fellowship together with one another to be encouraged and re-energized as they go back and, and continue to serve you. Father, as they serve, Lord God, would you just continue to give them much direction and wisdom and, and just a heart to serve and walk in obedience. God, we thank you for them and uh, we leave them in your care. We pray this in Jesus' holy name, amen. amen. Thank you very much, you guys.